Hi everyone. Um, welcome to the final day of 18th century Africa. Um, thank you all for, for joining. Uh, I am Adifola Tomuatui, here to present a paper on urban planning in 18th century Kano. I am glad to be a panelist at this workshop and I look forward to your questions afterwards. The world city of Kano, Northern Nigeria, is one of the evidences of thriving African cities centuries before first European contact with the continent. The 18th century is especially crucial to Kano's history as this was the last century of autonomous reign for the Hausa kingdoms just before the jihad forms of the early 1800s and subsequent British colonial domination a century after. Up until the 20th century, Western scholarship on Africa, supported by the Amity hypothesis, considered African urban civilizations as uncivilized or at best borrowed. For too long, this hypothesis did a huge disturbance to the various civilizations in sub Saharan Africa, which had thrived long before foreign exploration and trade occurred on the continent. By the 18th century, the city of Kano had become known not only in Africa, but across the world, far up into present Middle East and Asia. This was due to its heterogeneous urban nature, its centrality in the trans Saharan trade routes, and export trade, especially of textile products and leather. Non indigenous accounts of Kano has been recorded since the 15th century with Neo Africanist accounts of Hausa land. And which back in his visit to Kano in the 1850s praised the scenery of the town in its great variety of clay houses, huts, sheds, green open spaces that afforded pasture for animals. He also described the deep hollows containing ponds and pits created for the manufacture of building materials. After imperial British conquest of 1900, Sir Frederick Lugard, the first governor general of British colonial Nigeria, reports on Kano as the commercial emporia of the Western Sudan. Regarding the city wall, he remarks, I have never seen nor even imagined anything like it in Africa. The most notable indigenous account of Kano is the Tariq Arbab Hadja Adha Al Balad and Musamba Kano, popularly known as the Kano Chronicles. It was translated to English in 1908 by Sir Richmond Palmer. This historical source, written in Arabic and indigenous Ajami text by scholars of Kanu, provides an understanding of local history narrated from the recollections of its residents. This is unlike earlier and later accounts of the city by Arabs and Europeans. The Kanu Chronicles is a king's list with commentaries that provides in-depth information on the history of Kanu society. Despite the authorship and origin of this historical source, it's still a debated subject. It is considered one of the most reliable accounts of Kano from the 1000s to the late 19th century. Kano was not a city in isolation. Hence, I employed an externalist approach to urban morphology, which views urban forms as the end product of political, anthropological, geographical, economical, historical, and perceptual determinants. Various cities formed the Hausa Bafa city state. These Hausa cities stretched their origins to the same progenitor, and their city state status grew alongside their counterparts. Furthermore, Kano and its counterpart Hausa cities developed a satellite urban settlement and formed an organized network of trade relations. So, textiles from Kano, markets from Kassina and Daura, militia from Gobi and slaves from Zaria sustained trade and commerce. However, this was frequently disrupted by incessant wars and conflicts among the Hausa kingdoms. Kano and other Hausa city-states had a similar city layout. This city-state of Berlin was the cosmopolitan center which could be conceptualized in three categories. First is the inner core called the Chicken Gari. Second is the central core called the Sakia Gari and the outer core called the Wajengari. So that is right here on the slide, it's inner core and central core, and the outskirts on, along the walls was called the Wajengari. It is, was surrounded by a thick mud wall called the Ganua and accessed through various city gates called Kotba. This city layout is generally standardized in other ancient house cities, such as neighborhood Zaria and Kastina. 
The urban growth of Kanut is described as organic, meaning that the city grew based on socio political, economical, and religious reasons. The evidences of this urbanization is the city's gradual expansion of its walls. The city walls of Kano, just as its neighboring outside cities and other African cities such as Ife and Kor, served various purposes. They provided refuge during the raid, served as immigration and customs control, and sources of income for the government through taxation. Moody in 1967 categorizes the periods of expansion and renovation of the city walls to three phases, that is the 11th to 12th century, the 15th century, and the 17th century. These categorizations were based on space surface exam examinations alongside oral and documentary sources. So the first city, first phase of the city walls. The early settlement in Kanu is traced to 635 AD at Dalai, still within the ancient world city. Early traditional Aosa religions, which venerated spirits, may have attracted the first settlement to Dalai, named after the spirit of Dalai. The hill formed the core of the new town and the foundation of its economic and political development. The first wall was constructed and completed between 1095 and 1134 during the raids of Saraki, Kijimasu, and Son Turaki. The Kano Chronicles further tells that Kano was still expanding as a new city with attempts to conquer neighboring towns. Fortification meant refuge during sieges and campaigns, which would become commonplace in Kano's relationships with his neighbors. Growth of settlements outside the city during this period declined, and mass migrations asserted Kano's status as an urban center. Some studies have further suggested that the walls were made of wooden stockade. This map shows the second phase of the city wall expansion. In the 15th century, Islam was established as a state religion by the ruler Saraki Kufa. His reign marked the transformation of Kanu from a growing city into a commercial center of centralized power. This was the result of Kanu's growing role in trans Saharan trade and its position as a tributary state in the Songhai Empire. A permanent market, the Kumi Market, was established south of Dalai. Alongside the Kumi Market was the palace, Gidarufa, and the mosque. The market, the palace, and the mosque, this trio, became the new set of, seat of commerce and governance. This moved the city core from the former nucleus around Dalai Hill. From this, new, new, from this new core was a radial network of road that led to other parts of the city. The walls were substantial earth ramparts plastered with mud bricks and solid wood plates. Rumfa was painted for redefining the medieval city of Kanu. The Kanu Chronicles praised Saraki Rumfa as, quote, having no equal in might from the time of the founding of Kanu until it shall end, end quote. Another city extension was recorded to have occurred in the 17th century during the reign of Saraki Muhammad Nazaki. The city expanded to the southwest and more gates were added to its walls. The Kano Chronicles described the construction as expensive and inclusive of the people in the city. It states that it spent an enormous amount of money on this improvement. Every morning, it brought a thousand calabashes of food and 50 oxen for the workmen till the work was to be finished every man went to work. This attests to Kano's wealth and status, his dedicated process of construction and possibly newer construction techniques. City walls were not extended in the 18th century, but new markets at Makubo and Naisal were established. These markets were relo relocated afterwards. The location of Naisal markets is suggested to have been located within the vicinity of Naisa Gate, which is in this area. The 18th century Kano was marked by constant warfare and economic decline. Massive military campaigns against neighbors, especially Gobir in the north, occurred. Taxes were intensified on agricultural, agricultural yields, goods, and even new brides. The situation was synonymous to other outside cities at the time. This marked the beginning of the Fulani Jihad led by Usman Dampodio that campaigned against religious syncretism and harsh economic conditions on the core. The 18th century was a period to Fulani conquest of Kano and the creation of the Sokoto Caliphate. Kano became an emirate in 1804. They established, they established 
development of Sokoto Caliphate enhanced the preeminence of Kanu. Its reputation as a center for trade and commerce resulted in it becoming the economic nerve center of the new government with an organized army and well-fortified city force. Its already thriving urban form may not have warranted further changes in, in the city. Colonial Kano saw major spatial changes which occurred outside of the city walls, indirect rule of northern Nigeria and segregation of the colonialist and the colonized may have aided preservation of the old city. On the outskirts, the European quarters were located at Nasarai and Bompai. Savongari became the residential quarters for Nigerians from the South and other British West Africans. The Northern Nigerians who identified as Aousas lived in Fagi, close to the city, close to the um, city walls, and they will later on extend to Tutunwada and Kwagwara. In post-colonial times to the present, the world city morphology has slightly changed. Vehicular roads radiating from the Kurumi market, which is still linked to the Emirates Palace and its central mosque. The conversions of these old lanes or walkways called Gadwadabi into motorized roads is the major physical change in the world city during this period. However, the city walls have lost their functional purpose. Only a few of the walls survive to the present with few reconstructions. Many gates have also been rebuilt. A new gate called the Sabua Kofa was constructed after Imperial British reign and still exists today, as seen in this image, showing the old city, city wall and constructed one. My further inquiry into the urban form of Kano in the 18th century would be to view the sea, not only in its form, but in its change of use. Our land and property used by the Tsarkis in the elaborate taxation systems to fund wars. How did these administrative decisions influence the use of urban form? Also, did the built environment of Kanu in any way play a role in citizens' insurrection and Fulani military campaign? These directions of inquiry, the strong inclination towards indigenous historical manuscripts and oral history, will help in understanding the urban Kanu in the 18th century as it relates to changing social political climate of the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and then um, finally, in this panel, we have um, Roger Blench. Um, I have a pre-recorded one if, he, if your internet is bad, Roger. So um, just let me know what you want to do. Okay, I'm gonna start the pre-recorded one and if Roger wants to jump in, he can um, let me know. Uh, hi everyone, greetings from Nigeria. Uh, this is a pre-recorded <coughs> version of a 10 minute version of my talk, uh, just in case the internet connection uh, goes down all too frequent here in Nigeria or also. Um, I feel like I'm on the front line of history here in Nigeria. Uh, we have spent all day working with the Yebu people on the history of their clans and subclans and uh, the organization of rainmakers chiefs and so on so uh, it's very much the, the chalk face of history I, I, I would say here anyway just to uh, give you a very brief overview of what my long talk is you can read the powerpoint and you can read the whole paper um, the paper is basically about methods uh, of reconstructing uh, the history of uh, central Nigeria here, uh, roughly before uh, the major disruptions caused by the slave trade from the end of the 18th uh, and into the 19th century. So the big deal here was that with the rise of uh, the Trans-Saharan slave trade and the import of guns and the import of large horses, uh, the slave raiding by uh, the 
large polities in the north, that is the Hauserland and the Kanuri area in Bornu, uh, really accelerated. It accelerated to the point where the middle belt here became a sort of wasteland. Um, people were forced up into defensive hill settlements or else into surrounding their compound by rings and rings of spiny cactus, which were very difficult for the raiders to enter, but this made farming extremely unsafe. So you had a, a, a major breakdown of patterns of social interaction, patterns of uh, marital interaction and, and long distance trade. So how can we think about uh, what things looked like before that? Well, obviously written sources are few and far between. Uh, one of the things that's been fascinating me recently is the uh, Venetian map by Frau Mauro 1450, which remarkably shows quite a few ethnic groups and settlements in Niger, what is now Nigeria. Um, we don't know what from our sources of information were, but presumably travelers passed through Venice and he was an assiduous interviewer. Anyway, it's an impressive document. Then there are uh, the local chronicles, particularly the Kano Chronicle and the various chronicles of Borno. These give you some information, although they're mostly king lists or lists of battles. Um, unfortunately, again, the, the minority peoples of the Middle Belt here are largely seen as victims of slave raiding, even though we know uh, in some cases that they fought back pretty courageously. And then we obviously have the very earliest travelers who are in the 1820s, Clapperton and Denham, and they give us some idea of what uh, Nigeria was like on that cusp of change. But these are pretty minor sources, really. I think uh, what's more important is, above all, ethnography, comparative ethnography. Um, we have a very large number of ethnic groups, we, we estimate around 250 across the Middle Belt. Uh, very few of them have any in-depth ethnography at all, and very few of them have historical uh, investigations. So it's very much a, a virgin field. I mean, there are a few local monographs, um, which are extremely valuable, but they are just a spots of light in a, an area which is otherwise somewhat obscure. Uh, there are some, some nice uh, records of oral traditions. Oral traditions, I should say here, have a, a big problem, which, which is that they are tend to be messed up by learned, learned interventions, which has people migrating from Egypt or Palestine or what have you. And Sometimes the, the more local migrations, which are of much greater interest, are disrupted. So I have been over the last 30 years collecting a great amount of these traditions from different peoples, looking at both at historical traditions, but also at uh, you know, synchronic ethnography. In other words, how do people organize their society locally? And once you do this sort of comparative work, you, big patterns emerge, you know, of initiation cycles, uh, masquerades, uh, types of trade item. And so gradually, I think we're, we're beginning to get a, a bigger picture of, of the system that was at least transformed radically by the slave trade and, of course, later uh, by the British. I, the talk and the PowerPoint look particularly at a couple of issues. Uh, one of them is what's usually referred to as the Colombian Exchange. This is the uh, massive input of new crops in particular from the New World, uh, crops like maize and cassava and peppers and tomatoes and guavas and papayas. These 
were introduced uh, certainly on the coast and sometimes also via the Trans-Saharan trade from the Maghreb. And in some cases, they pretty much transformed people's agriculture. They allowed them uh, to produce on very infertile soils. And they spread from farmer to farmer well in advance, for example, of the colonial regime. So, you know, by the 17th and 18th centuries, maize is already well established in central Nigeria. So these uh, crops had an important role in transforming subsistence. So another interesting issue is iron. Okay, iron goes back a long way in Nigeria. I mean, the first furnaces that we have dated are around 500 BP, 2,500 years ago. Gradually, over the millennia, uh, iron production ramped up, uh, and obviously iron transforms subsistence because it means you can cut down forests more quickly and you can uh, farm more effectively with iron tools. So from the 16th century onwards, um, what you might call sub-industrial iron begins to penetrate from the coast. Uh, trading ships bring, bring iron in, in ingots, and as European technology gradually developed uh, to make uh, iron and steel production more effectively, so iron began to move into uh, the trade and exchange systems, again, well in advance of uh, actual physical penetration by colonial forces. This had interesting effects on uh, exchange systems because people began to construct uh, iron artifacts which were used for uh, trade, which were, although based on things like hose and other useful items, had to become uh, completely useless in, in functional terms and began to be used purely for trade. So uh, iron had a very interesting impact on accelerating, uh, if you like, abstract trade, moving away from the barter systems into a quasi-monetary system. So this is something that is reflected uh, often in museum collections, but not necessarily uh, in any sort of uh, useful way in understanding big patterns of, of regional exchange. Well, obviously there's, there's loads more stuff uh, which we could look at. Um, there are a couple of things which I, I think are really important. Uh, one of these is DNA. Now, DNA has begun to revolutionize our understanding of uh, the, the prehistory of Africa, especially in Eastern and Southern Africa. There have been a number of significant papers recently. Uh, West Africa, unfortunately, remains a bit of a poor relation in this respect, uh, poor sampling and, and relatively few papers. Uh, I hope in the coming years this is going to change, and I, th I think this will bring important new, new news, as it were, to the pattern of the peopling of central Nigeria. The other thing I have hopes for is the more scientific archaeology. I mean, recent advances in archaeology have allowed us to do things like reconstruct diet and to look at uh, you know, patterns of, say, pastoralism versus farming and, and what crops people are growing and so on. Um, and archaeobotany has certainly increased a great deal uh, in the last few years. I'm just hoping that some uh, more exciting results will come out of this region. Okay, that's sort of what I want to say. I mean, one thing that's on my mind if I'm based here in Nigeria is, is simply mobilizing a local interest in collecting and writing up historical and ethnographic materials. Um, this is not necessarily high on the agenda of most of the universities here. I mean, they're perhaps more tapped into some international system of concept of what history is, and relatively few students are really working on rebuilding an understanding of local history. This is unfortunate and something I'm personally involved in trying to change. Anyway, we'll, we'll see what direction that goes in.
Okay, that's a sort of summary, roughly, of what um, the longer talk says, uh, with lots more illustrations and so on. So I hope you find it interesting. Um, and thank you, Roger, for sending that in. Um, Roger is here, um, and so I would ask all of the speakers um, to um, feel free to turn on your cameras and unmute yourselves. Um, and um, we will allow you to <laughs> uh, answer questions. So, and we will start as we have been um, with uh, a sort of chance for you to ask each other questions um, about your papers um, and your approaches. I think actually there was just like an amazing amount of uh, synergy in this panel um, because you were all talking about places that are currently in Nigeria and um, but not the same place. So hopefully that gives us lots of things to talk about. Um, so I, I um, am happy to open it up to, to you guys to start if any of you have questions for each other. You're all using really different approaches as well. Does it, do any of you have any questions? Okay, um, so John Thornton, um, did you want to ask your, your question or did you want me to ask it first? Oh, uh, well, okay. I'll... Oh, it was okay, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so um, my question was concerning Kano. And um, I wanted to know, I, I know in the Kano Chronicle we have um, the descriptions at the beginning, especially, but even through the thing of a rivalry between Muslim or apparently Muslim people in the first part and the traditional people. And so there's a whole set of thing about the Sunkumbaye, whatever his name is, the snake and so on. Um, and then that disappears sort of in the 16th century and then it reemerges in the 18th century. So I, I know also that when, when Rimfa received um, his advice on good government, um, he was advised to, uh, to separate the Muslims from the traditional people and not allow them to mingle so much. And I just wondered, given there's a spatial com component to that, both in terms of Santolo Hill and, um, and the other hill, <laughs> um, I wondered if that could be, is that, is that represented anyway in the archeology? span I mean, recognizing that you're digging in a living city and you can't just do whatever you want. Oh, yes, thank you very much, Mark. In the 15th century and afterwards, the kind of segregation between or the distinction between the people who have accepted the religion and the new education that came with it began to be seen as indeed the civilized people in the city, while those who stuck to their um, traditional religions were seen as backward and poor. These things actually even translated in the architecture since the new Muslims took on the architecture of the Middle East or Islamic architecture, while the um, traditional architecture of the indigenous houses were that of mud houses and mud huts. But in urban form, I would say that the people who were seen now as the pagans or the idolaters or the, yeah, I would say that when we we have gradually moved away from the city center. So you see that the nucleus of the city was where the commerce, the activity, education was going on, the new kind, while those who stuck to their uh, forefathers' um, traditions moved to the outskirts of the city. And I can, so I can guess that this also um, translated into um, economic or social um, classification or social status of the people as those ones that are on the, on the outskirts we're not in the, we're not really active in governance or commerce. So they were probably mostly seen as poor. And I also add that even um, centuries after when Usman Dafodio became a known figure, he actually championed the causes of these poor people, even though they were not Muslims, they were pagans, and he was actually fighting the government on religious syncretism during that time. Hmm. I hope that answers your question. Fine, thank you. Blasi, do you want to jump in too? Yes, thank you so much. So um, I just want to contribute um, from an archaeological perspective. And um, like we know that one of the challenges that we have as archaeologists is um, the emergence of, or development of um, urban centers 
urban cities now, which has resulted to the destruction of many archaeological materials. So in that case, even if those relics are, were there, you know, as, as archaeologists, we may not find it um, available in the um, available during excavation if there had been developments um, over the years. But in case we are fortunate to do so, we might get evidence um, such as um, maybe broken spear, you know, materials that are related to war, maybe broken spear. We could also find such evidence in terms of um, maybe mound, um, relics of mound, or even um, relics of um, traditional um, belief um, systems. Like I remember that uh, um, there was a work that was done by, I think, um, Oswald Jones in Ibado at a time where he did um, an ethnographic work or, uh, of um, a settlement. And there he even got, if from, the, from his excavation, he got um, Islamic materials like um, this, um, this um, prayer, prayer board, you know, relics of prayer board and stuff like that. And there he was able to establish that um, those at, that at a point, um, do, the settlers of those places were uh, mainly um, Islamic, you know, before they were um, resettled from that region. So such materials, we could find that in the archaeological record if development has, have not taken over such area. Thank you. Um, so um, Anne, Anne Hauer has a follow-up question um, regarding this. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the speakers. Mine is, is a very broad question, I'm, I'm sorry. I was struck by the, the huge diversity of perspectives that you all employed. Um, I, 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 I was very interested in the comments on the, on the, on the Cano Chronicle. I was very interested in, in Roger's observation about the cold face of history. And I suppose for all four, I would like to, to ask what constitutes history. There's a huge literature, for instance, on the Canon Chronicle and the speakers touched on this and how reliable it may be or not. The fact that it may well be a 19th century creation. And I guess in the highly diverse context of Nigeria, would you feel that there is perhaps a disjunction in terms of what is known about the northern part of the country and the southern part? And I'm obviously generalizing hugely here. Uh, you talk of Ife, and of course you've got Imbantuta and the whole John Thornton and others have discussed and John Sutton, whether or not Imbantuta was referring to, to Ife. Um, the kind of chronicle is, is, is a, a late source. I guess I'm addressing these comments also in, in the knowledge that many people here may not be uh, from, from kind of the Nigerian context. And just to highlight the huge diversity, I suppose in the historical sources that we have that relate to what is now the territory of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And I suppose I was inviting a comment on, on that diversity and perhaps on the different strengths of the various sources that relate to different areas, linked to Islam, linked to oral tradition, perhaps uh, changed by colonial history. So I'm sorry, this is an enormous question, but I was just struck by the enormous diversity in, in the material that you were presenting. I think you can all respond to that. That's really for everybody. So. Well, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Hello? Yep. Um, I think it's important to note that the Bornu material is much richer than the Kano Chronicle. It's richer in, in terms of there are multiple sources, not just one. Uh, some of the manuscripts are relatively older, I think, but also there's more narrative material in them. In other words, they, they discuss more than just, uh, you know, a list of kings. They're, they're, they're much more interesting in that respect. So I think there's actually, there's a richer resource in the Bornu material than there is in the Kano Chronicle, frankly. The other thing is that we, we understand from the history of Bornu from the archives in Cairo. In other words, a, because there was a lot of traffic between uh, Lake Chad and Cairo, we get a lot of references to political developments in Bornu there. So in terms of sources, these, these are actually far more interesting 
than the Carnot Chronicle. I agree with um, what John said. The Carnot Chronicles is laced or buried into a lot of debates on its authenticity, who wrote it, and at what period. And some, people, some scholars believe that it was written way like in the 19th century or so. But I would say one of the issue or one of the one of the what kind of chronicles has going for it is that it's just one of the few manuscripts that have been dis rediscovered during colonial period and have been translated to English. So it kind of brought a new light into this um, part of canon history for um, historians trying to understand what Kano was during this period. So obviously as an as an as a an historical source, there are a lot of debate about it. But I would also say that we can also try to still sieve out the um the facts from the embellishments. Like from the canon chronicles are where other scholars have gotten the faces, how they categorize it how they categorize the city walls. And I think probably as a king's list or list of kings, it did a good job since oral tradition would have brought them, would have um, carried that down to the generation. Um, I also say um, Anne's question on the diversity of um, Nigerian cities. For instance, probably not, probably not in the 18th century, but in the 19th century when um, Kano and his other outside cities became more um, homogeneous in nature, when the Sokoto Caliphate, Caliphate took hold, we see that they, they had a massive military campaign downwards in the south of what we now know as Nigeria, even up to Ilori. So I would say that maybe decades after these um, civilizations or these cities became, became, became to be more, um, began to be more connected than before. And I think it's also interesting to know that from everybody else's presentations, the things I don't even know about some cities in my country, like Ife or Ilori, is even brought to light right now. Like I know because of this project, find this paper, I know more about Kano than I know more about Ife, like a city just, I, I don't know more about Ife, like a city just close to me. Thank you. Yes, um, I would like to speak on Anne's question about diversity. So, um, Oyo and the Oyo Empire and the Ife Empire, Ife, Ife City, were actually located close to one another. And even though the Oyo Empire in that time was actually larger, they had a an unspoken treaty. Not on, on, they had a treaty where um, the Oyo people already promised that they were not and other. Um, neighboring and they had that with the Benin as well that they were not going to attack them so they had like an under, understanding between the kings and the chiefs and all of that so they found a way to coexist without trying to um, um try to clear the place for land and all of us yes, thank you yes and um i would also like to add that um uh, well i wouldn't um, say about Kano Chronicles, I'll focus on my area, which is Ilori. And um, we found evidence where, um, where um, there is an historical version which claims that Ilori was um, part of um, one of the, one of the, um, uh, one of the sons of all the, one of the areas of um, the Aousa land. And um, as a result of that, you know, um, this has really caused a lot of um, conflict and a lot of um, historians have raised issues around that, that it's, um, that it's because in um, Aousa land, there were, and, uh, and during the Jihad period, there was this um, pro um, promotion of um, Islam. And so as a result, um, the, those people were using the, um, their, that um, disjointed history, you know, to bring in, um, Ilori as part of Aousa land, whereas the Yorubas are also claiming that they were the initial uh, inhabitants of, uh, of um, Ilori. And so in that kind of scenario, we see that there's a lot of uh, conflict 
you know, in terms of um, information, in terms of historical um, information. And that is why we see that it is important um, as much as we use um, so many historical records as archeologists, we've come to realize that archeological in, um, investigation um, is very, very important in complementing all this, whatever information we get from wherever we might get it, even from Pano Chronicles, from yeah, Yoruba Chronicles or whatever, Archaeology has really helped us to understand uh, most of this uh, and place um, ma many of these societies within their right um, historical context. So um, that is um, my own contribution. Thank you. And did you have, a, you're still on video, so I was just wondering if you had a follow up to that or if that's it. Okay, great. No, no, thank you. Thank you. Um, so Mark uh, Horton has a question um, for Roger. Hi, Roger. Hi. Hey. <laughs> nice to see you, <laughs> even if you're in Nigeria. Now, I was just wanted to raise the, whole, the, sort of the white hope of archaeological science um, and some of the problems that are around with it. Um, that, you know, you say, great, let's do art, lots of archaeobotany and so forth. I mean, as you know, there has been amazing strides done in in archaeological science, particularly archaeology, archaeological botany in sub-Saharan Africa in recent years. But it's often been framed around the question of origins and beginnings, you know, the hunt for the, the earliest bit of sorghum or whatever it might be to, um, to create essentially a science type answer. And um, beginnings and origins is what, what um, as it were, driving people. But now, we go into the 18th century, it's much more difficult to frame those scientific questions because these forms of scientific investigations are very expensive to do. The people who do them want to publish in Science and Nature and all those other big high impact journals. Um, and kind of 18th century historical questions are much more difficult to find. So <laughs> that, that kind of will engage a reader of nature. So I was really just because of a bit of a word of caution that it's up to us historians, historical archaeologists, to find the questions that are high impact that will excite the scientists. Um, and one other thing I, I might say is there's a lot of the archaeological science is now based around human remains, skeletal remains, um, ancient DNA, isotopes, and so forth. Um, and of course, these are often very culturally sensitive. Um, particularly as we get into more recent centuries. So I just want to put a bit of a damper, you know, that by all means the technology is there to answer some of these questions, but actually there are limitations. Uh, look, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's a, a major problem that people want to find the oldest millets and not look at... Uh, I, in my talk, I highlighted the impact of the Columbian Exchange, i.e. the transformation of agricultural systems from the, the 16th century onwards by completely new crops coming in. This is going to show up in the archaeobotanical record if somebody is looking for it. But if they're looking for the oldest millet, then they're, they're not going to answer <laughs> this question, unfortunately. Uh, Mark, I, I, I completely agree. I mean, what can we do to make more recent history sexy? I, I, I don't know, frankly. Um, what can, I, what can I say? I, I agree entirely, but but it should be interesting. That's the point. Yeah, I, I, no I'm reason. with you, Roger. Absolutely. We have to do it. Um, I mean, yeah. the Columbian Exchange, there's a little bit of work on the Columbian Exchange, and just some of the archaeobotanical, the little bit that's been done, suggests it was incredibly rapid, the, almost yes. instantaneous in the 16th century. It's a remarkable thing. Um, and that surely is a, is a statement for the origins of the Anthropocene. Yeah, the, the, the spread of maize is astonishingly quick into the interior of Nigeria and, and you know, uh, uh, lots of questions about why that should be so. Great. <laughs> Great. Uh, can, I, uh, can I make another point, if, if I'm allowed? Yeah. Uh, totally different. Uh, a few years ago, I had a chance to go around a lot of the major palaces in northern Nigeria and to have a look inside. Um, 
they are like archaeological sites all of themselves. Uh, all, all of them have had a, a wonderful new facade put up recently with wonderful acrylic paint covers. But as you go inside, there are sort of walls after walls, and the walls and get more and more ancient as you go into the interior. And sometimes there are archaic doors and there are all sorts of things. In other words, as you get penetrate the palace, you can you can go backwards in history. Um, it's remarkable what what's to be seen in sort of Katsina and Balchi and places like that. And I can't urge more strongly that you know there is more work on these palaces in case some exciting new architect decides to knock them down completely and replace them with a, a modern palace suited to the 21st century. They are wonderful places still, even though the, the facade perhaps makes them seem uh, a bit, uh, you know, what can I say, Mo modern. But, but in fact, inside, there's all sorts of interesting things to be seen. That brings us perfectly to Tim's question. Tim, do you want to hop on? Sure. Oh, thank you so much. Um, it's for uh, uh, Atafole. Um, I, as a legal historian of pre-colonial Sierra Leone, I got involved in a very small project about the walls of Kano. So uh, I just had, I, I just thought your paper was brilliant and just answered a lot of questions for me. But uh, I, I wanted to uh, ask you if, if you could, if you have done anything like in the way of com uh, comparative analysis of other walled cities in uh, Hausalam and to see if some of those same dynamics were taking place, albeit on a smaller scale than Kano, but if those dynamics were taking place that you so uh, brilliantly uh, presented to us. Thank you, Tim. That's a very, very good suggestion. But I haven't gone into other cities apart from Kano, although it's just probably Zaria that I have read in the past. Day. And I would say each city had its dynamic um, settings that influenced its um, urban form. For instance, when I said that um, Kano was was majorly based, uh, majorly influential in commerce, cities like um, Zaria were influential in the trade of slaves. So probably going into that, we we'll see things that connect um, Trans-Saharan, or probably Trans-Atlantic slavery, or new mm -hmm. um, pockets of research that can come up if we go into other cities. But thank you for the suggestion. Sorry to give you more work. <laughs> Great. Um, and I think we're going to have to end that panel there. Um, thank you all so much. That was a really fascinating and um, an excellent panel. Um, and now we're going to move on um, to our uh, final panel of the whole thing, <laughs> um, which is our final two speakers um, on the topic of gender. Um, so uh, Katie Boyle is up first. Hi, everyone. Let me just share my screen. Can everyone see that OK? Hopefully, yes. All righty. So thank you, Bronwyn, conference organizers, fellow panelists, workshop colleagues for creating such a generative space for conversation over the past two weeks. My name is Katie Boyle, and I'm a cultural and social historian in training, focusing on transregional slave trades in 18th and 19th century North Africa and the French Empire. I would also like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the native lands of the Nacotchtank and Piscataway peoples, or so-called Arlington, Virginia, United States, and that I'm a guest on this land. Um, I'll start this presentation by stating the obvious. Archival research has been greatly restricted due to COVID. However, I have found close reading published Tunisian palace chronicles to be fruitful for thinking locally and transregionally about 18th century Ottoman Tunis. Indeed, such palace chronicles, which feature numerous mentions of enslaved people from Saharan and Mediterranean trades, have served as a useful counterpoint to dominant historiographical tendencies, um, which treat North Africa as if, separate, uh, as if separate from the rest of the African continent. This can, be, this can be seen in the conventional map of Tunis and the Ottoman Empire on the left, compared to a 19th century Ottoman map of the African continent 
Um, and this can help reframe the discursive location of North Africa and Tunis in particular. But for the purposes of today's panel theme, my brief presentation will center on two particular tales of friendship and intimacy as recorded by the 18th century Ottoman Tunisian palace chronicler, Mahmed Asakir ibn Yusuf. The friendship between Ali, the nephew of the Tunisian provincial governor or the Bey, and a sheikh and presumed oracle, Mehmed Atunsi, was considered prime fodder for scandalous gossip among elites and royal intimates in 1720s Tunis, the capital of the North African Ottoman province of the same name, and what we know today as Tunisia. When I first came upon this passage in a late 19th century French colonial translation, I was fascinated by the terms used to describe the royal and the sheikh, as well as the terms of dependency used to describe the Bey's relationship to notables and counselors. I believe this tale and close readings of the Palace Chronicle in the original 18th century classical Arabic, juxtaposed against later translations, helps contemporary researchers place under-examined tropes of friendship, intimacy, and masculinity in local and trans-regional historical perspective. I maintain that taking these terms used by the chronicler seriously can shed light on how such dependencies shaped statecraft and later state formation in the region. So let's dive further into this passage from Ibn Yusuf's chronicle. Hassin Bey, the Ottoman Turkish governor of Tunis in the early to mid 18th century lacked male heirs. So he symbolically tapped his nephew Ali to be future ruler by appointing him head of the Mahala or annual tax gathering mission throughout the province. This delegation of authority would turn out to be ill-fated for Ali, however, after Hassin Bey became enamored with an enslaved 20-year-old Genovese woman captured on the Mediterranean's high seas and made her his new concubine in the Bardo, the royal household harem and primary center of power and governance. Among freeborn noblewomen and other elites, this unnamed captive, compelled to convert to Islam, found in conversion greater opportunities to socially advance. Hassin fussed over their firstborn child, Mehmed, who he now hoped would be his heir. The only obstacle in his way was his nephew, Ali. Looking for advice, Hassin Bey sought assistance from one of his intimates, who convinced him to give Ali an honorific title from the center of Ottoman governance in Istanbul. He also advised the Bey to set his nephew up in an elite's home in Tunis capital to soften the blow of his demotion. Ali, however, was not fooled. While outwardly grateful for his new title of Pasha and an upgraded home, he fumed with bitterness over his loss of status for which no extravagant home or title could serve as compensation. In 1725, he sought solace in a close companionship with a sheikh and presumed oracle from outside the circle of Bardo elites in Mehmed Atunsi, and immediately rumors flew. The chronicler Ibn Yusuf himself remarked with an aside about the scandal of their intimacy writing that he had witnessed with his own eyes the proximity of Ali's beloved Habibi, al Tunsi's bedroom to the new Pasha's own living quarters. Hassin Bey's friends and intimates, whom the chronicler calls Ashab, in turn were up in arms, warning the Bey of the wider ramifications of such treachery. The Bey's intimates, notables and learned counselors, refer to themselves humbly as Yusuf narrates. We are your servants, Hidamik, and we will be harmed by the misfortunes which this dangerous man is preparing for you, who only seeks to thwart your authority. Curiously, rather than describing Ali's Pasha's close relationship with the powerful Sheikh as a threat solely to the Bey's person, these familiars of the Bey declared this relationship to be potentially detrimental to them as well, in their capacity as friends, subjects, and ultimately servants of the Bey. The gravity of such relationships then begs the question, what did friend or intimate mean to Tunisian elites at this time? I understand this passage to be most cogent through the lens of gender theory out of both Euro-American as well as Maghrebi and Islamic contexts. Gender historians at the Maghreb have tended to provide much needed revisionist histories of women in the 18th and 19th centuries or gender studies on the contemporary Maghreb. To this pioneering literature, I offer an historical analysis of masculinity in 18th century Tunis that builds on gender historian Afsane Najmavadi's visual analysis of gender age systems in Qajar Iran, 
and theorist Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick's notion of homosociality, which she defined as, quote, a culturally and diachronically determined continuum uh, that spans both sexual and non-sexual relations between men. I argue that this deployment of friendship in Yusuf's chronicle suggests that the scandal was less about a potential same-sex relationship, but rather had more to do with the potential threat to the base power vis-a-vis -vis the oracle slash uh, sheikh. Here, homosocial desire operated as an affective or social force, locally and historically understood, not in terms of gender sex differentiation, as contemporary researchers may assume, but rather through other more pertinent constructions of difference, particularly age, genealogy, class, and race. A parallel instance of homosociality appearing in Yusuf's chronicle almost two decades later in 1742 in the smoldering embers of civil war. Ali Pasha ultimately murdered his uncle, Hassin Bey, after gaining the loyalty of disaffected elites in Tunis and inhabitants in the mountains south and west of the capital. But not feeling secure enough in his new position, Ali enlisted the palace Mamluks, or elite enslaved people, as well as the Regency's inhabitants to bankrupt or slaughter his uncle's partisans, including the mixed race Turkish Tunisian Kululi soldiers who had fought on Hussein's behalf. In one city, Ali had ordered the inhabitants to liquidate all assets of the Kululi soldiers, yet the new ruler was struck by the plea of a beautiful youth, who Yusuf described as, quote, a young boy just beginning to grow a beard or lehya, with hands blackened by coal, but whose misery could not efface his beauty, end quote. The young man hailed from the province of Tunis and claimed that a Turkish soldier had stolen the coal he hoped to sell to provide for his destitute family. Ali asked him if he was Arab, to which, after a period of silence, he responded that he was in fact Kuludi. The youth begged Ali to show mercy to him and his father, and because Ali was so enamored by the youth's beauty, the ruler wept with great emotion. The chronicler Yusuf goes so far as to say that his, must his mustache whiskers, or sharibuhu, trembled as tears fell down his cheeks. He offered the youth monetary compensation, then had the Turkish soldier strangled. While the chronicler does not use explicit terms of friendship to describe this interaction, I offer this narrative to reinforce how tropes of homosociality and difference were structured in the period not in terms of sex gender, but rather in terms of age status. Yusuf emphasized the hirsute features of Ali compared to the nascent beard of the youth in ways consistent with age gender systems in other Islamic societies as well as explicitly drawing on tropes from classical Arabo-Islamic poetry, which romanticized the sexual allure of young boys and men, or khilman. While the Kululi had little to offer the ruler, his youthful beauty was leveraged in acquiring compensation from Ali, despite the ruler's crusade against mixed-race Kululi families in the region. So just to conclude, discourse around friendship and intimacy in 18th century Tunis, as evidence in Yusuf's palace chronicle, signals that such categories are not merely timeless notions, but rather like gender and sexuality operated as constructed and historical categories of analysis that merit closer attention, not only for understanding interpersonal daily life at the palace level in Ottoman Tunis, but also to highlight such relationships as foundational to 18th century statecraft and later iterations of autonomous and colonial state formation in the 19th century, thus questioning the notion of the French Tunisian protectorate as empire on a shoestring, and instead thinking cl more closely about local iterations of power, elite partnerships, and dependencies to which European colonial powers may have been compelled to adopt. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Katie. Um, and I think actually that's gonna lead really well to um, Mary's paper. So Mary, um, you want that? Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for that, Katie. Also, thank you, Bronwyn, uh, and to the rest of the organizers as well. Um, okay, so I'm gonna be speaking about uh, gen gender or the gendered nature of wealth accumulation. Uh, in the Bight of Biafra, uh, during Atlanticization and the age of abolition. Um, so if you just bear with me a moment. 
I'm going to share my screen. Um, before I do, actually, I just want to say quickly, uh, rest in peace uh, to Dr. Catherine Anena, who I met um, in Cambridge uh, in 2017 when I started my MPhil in African Studies. Um, she was such an amazing woman. I just got news today that she passed away a couple of days ago due to COVID. Um, and I, yeah, I just felt it's important to acknowledge her. Um, and I'm a bit, I'm a little bit scattered, but hopefully I'll pull myself together. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Uh, here we go. Um, okay. Sorry. Okay, so the paper title is called Fattened Like Lambs for Slaughter, uh, The Gendered Nature of Wealth Accumulation in the Biafran Literal. Um, and so during Atlanticization, Biafran women were perceived by men, uh, that's European and African men alike as financial investments, uh, as currency, as economic devices capable of turning profits. Um, and in the Bight of Biafra, this was as true of elite women as it was of enslaved women. Um, so there's a growing body of literature which deals with prenuptial uh, seclusion and fattening rituals uh, in the Bight um, or the Cross River Basin. Um, however, much of this literature is located firmly within the disciplines of anthropology um, and art history as well. Um, so it tends towards being quite a historical. Um, so I've stumbled upon this a few years ago um, and I've been writing about it sort of fictionally um, and but then when I started my PhD, I came across uh, quite a few 19th century sources referring to this ritual and I thought, hmm, uh, let's find out what's going on here. Um, yeah, so I decided that I wanted to try and find out the origins, which to me at the time were sort of shrouded in mystery. Um, and what I've discovered is that it's linked to wealth accumulation, uh, specifically uh, Atlantic age wealth accumulation um, and gendered wealth accumulation. So that's what this paper argues. Um, and our story begins in January 1828 uh, in Duke Town, Old Calabar, um, with a narrative uh, one James Holman, um, self-styled blind traveler. Um, he was traveling, um, he was exploring the world actually. Um, and he's notable for the fact that he was completely blind in both eyes. So he's something of an unreliable narrator. Um, however, after requesting that he meet Duke Ephraim's Duke Ephraim was the appellation bestowed on the Obon of Old Calabar. Um, so yeah, after requesting that he meet his wives, uh, he wrote the following. Um, so his favorite queen, the handsomest of the royal party. Um, sorry, just bear with me. I'm not sure how to get off this. I'm not sure how to. No, to change the, I can't read what I'm uh, saying properly. Can't read this properly. Okay, I'm gonna try. So he's basically, his favorite queen, the handsomest of the royal party was so large that she could scarcely walk or even move. Indeed, they were all prodigiously large. Their beauty consisting more in mass of physique than in delicacy or symmetry of features or figure. This uniform tendency to embonpoint 
on an unusual scale was accounted for by the singular, singular fact that the female upon whom his majesty fixes his regards is regularly fattened up to a certain standard previous to the nuptial ceremony. It's appearing to be essential to the queenly dignity that she should be enormously fat. Um, and he goes on. Um, yeah, and I found that fascinating. Um, so what he didn't realize uh, was that he had stumbled on what the ethic term as mkugo, uh, mkugo literally translates to children of seclusion. Um, and it involves an initiatory process which can last from anywhere between a couple of weeks to a few years. Uh, it's dependent on things like the birth order of the initiate um, and also the means of the initiate's family. Um, and what would happen is there are several types of mpugo. Uh, so the first would usually occur with the onset of puberty, uh, the onset of menses, um, after the girl had been betrothed. And she would go into either the fattening room or the fattening house, depending on the wealth of her family, um, and undergo this process, which involves a symbolic breaking of the body, mind and spirit, uh, in order to make her malleable for marriage. Um, in, among some groups in the Cross River Basin, she would then undergo a clitoridectomy. Uh, not all groups participated in that. Um, and then she would be trained in how to keep a house, um, in the sexual arts, how to please her husband, how to beautify herself, um, in fertility rites, and she would be trained in how to rear children um, and how to manage a house effectively. Um, so that would involve like overseeing agricultural production and some forms of manufacturing as well. Um, so this is a picture of a girl uh, entering seclusion. Um, so as you can see, this is a, this is a child, a small child. So she would go into Mkugo. Uh, she's probably been betrothed at this point. Um, and depending on the means of her family, uh, she would be in there for probably a few years until she's fattened to a certain standard. Um, and once she had reached the desired weight and learned everything that she needed to learn, uh, some of the things that she would learn uh, was literacy as well. So. And she would be initiated into Nsibiri, uh, which was uh, uh, a pictorial script that predated Atlanticization. I'm not sure by how much. Um, and so after she learned these various things and she would reached a certain weight, then she would come out of the fattening house um, wearing various things. Um, and so this was the preserve of elites, uh, this practice. Um, it delineated elite women from enslaved women. Um, and so on the morning of their wedding day, they would receive gifts. Um, as Holman noted, a yard of cloth from one, some silk from another, beads from a third, according to the capacity of the donors. Um, and okay, so this is what I found interesting. Um, so when I started trying to find out, so this happens in 1828, uh, Holman encountering these women. So this is 20 years or so after British abolition. Um, but the illegal slave trade is just beginning to pick up. I believe it's the Hispanophone trade at this point. Um, so yeah, it's beginning to like really pick up in earnest. Um, yeah. <laughs> Basically, the story of the fattening house is a story of 17th and 18th century expansion. Um, it's about the emergence of a coastal mercantile class, uh, economic and cultural brokers who oversaw the rapid expansion of export slave markets and the introduction and proliferation of a consumer culture which stretched deep into the African hinterland. Um, it's difficult to date precisely when Nkugo emerged in the Biafran literal. 
because while the 19th century is replete with examples, um, the record of preceding centuries becomes much more sparse uh, because obviously those recording the goings on at the time, they were effectively recording, these were trade ledgers effectively. So they're not, they weren't really commenting on the appearance. Although as I started digging, uh, I started to find some sort of historical antecedents uh, for this culture of fattening, uh, for this beauty aesthetic, that of the fattened bride. Um, so going back to at least the mid 17th century, European visitors to the African coast uh, remarked sort of broadly uh, upon the plumpness or stoutness of African women. Um, so these were in cultures ranging from Cape Verde to the Gold Coast, Sierra Leone, Calabar, Iboland. Um, however, what was happening in Calabar, uh, in the Cross River Basin, in Ibibio land, Oron, the surrounding regions, um, is not really explained by what Europeans recorded uh, in the 17th centuries. Uh, and even prior to that, um, so perhaps one of the earliest surviving examples to indicate that Mkugo was proliferating among Biafran slave trading elites in pre preceding centuries comes from the records of a prominent ethnic slave trader, Antera Duke. So in his own hand, he writes of gender processes which have since come to be understood as being intrinsically part of the Mkugo ritual. Um, and to the untrained eye, these might not immediately indicate Nkugo. However, um, upon closer examination, you discover that he's not merely describing the composite parts, but he's describing the extent to which this practice was rooted in Atlantic age wealth accumulation. Um, and so he writes, January the 25th, the 1785, at three o'clock noon, everybody go to come dash Willie Honesty's daughter, 1,496 rods, be besides cloth and powder and iron. On October the 24th, 1785, uh, I see them take Duke's sister's daughter to his house to make her wear new cloth. So we and Duke did give about 20 pieces of cloth and we played or partied effectively all day before the night. And I believe this party carried on into the night as well. Uh, so December the 4th, 1787, I have my girl, Archibald Duke's son's sister, uh, put large manacles on her legs. So I paid the smith. Um, I can't see that. I think it's uh, one or a few um, umon yams, uh, one jar mimbo, and I think he's given some iron as well, some metal, I'm sorry, I really can't see it. Um, and so that's really fascinating uh, because it tells us a lot about what's valued um, in this culture at this time. Um, and so we come to the significance of currency, cloth, copper, and iron. Um, so commodities imported into the continent at the height of Atlanticization were unique to each market. These goods both reinforce existing preferences uh, and modified existing cultural practices, such as replacing barter exchange mechanisms uh, with currency exchange mechanisms. So in the Cross River Basin, wrought metal rods um, this is actually tying in really nicely to uh, Roger's paper. Um, so in the Cross River Basin, wrought metal rods, uh, other metal goods, um, they were critical in facilitating uh, the Anglo-African, the Anglo-Biafran slave trade. Um, and so what we see is that in the early, in the late, or sorry, in the early 17th century, um, or um, yeah, I'm a bit confused actually here. It's in the late 17th century towards the early 18th century, uh, quantities of iron, copper, and their derivatives, um, then, then not, 
it's not being imported in particularly large numbers, um, rather cloth. Um, cloth is king at, cert at a certain point. Um, however, a century later, by the 1780s, Biafran merchants have they accrued so much copper and iron that young women are being gifted extraordinary quantities. Um, so cloth remained a significant commodity right throughout Antiquization into the age of abolition. And in the Biafran literal, cloth and this voyage iron would prove inseparable from the cultures of fatting, which sprang up um, with the ballooning of export slave and consumer markets. Um, so in Old Calabar, small girls who belong to the Nkai sorry, Nkai Iferi age set, wore little save skirts made of bells or beads. And this only upon reaching the age of Nkugo. So Nkai Iferi literally translates to age of nakedness. Um, so in this regard, there's little to distinguish them from domestic slaves. However, following Nkugo, um, the girl would don her first new cloth. This is what Antara Duke was describing. Um, and as these girls attained ever high rank, they would have worn several layers of cloth knotted about their waists. Um, the, the cloth of the highest ranking women would have eventually resembled, particularly in places like New Calabar, the vol voluminous skirts with massive bustles worn by their English counterparts. Um, the, the, so the importation of iron and copper was, it was gendered. So men received pistols, uh, blonde bosses, different things. Um, when this iron, when this voyage iron was shaped, into Manilas, uh, which was part of the consumption bundles of this area, this shaping was significantly gendered. Um, so Captain Hugh Crow, a slave trader who was frequenting the region in the late 18th century wrote here as at Bonnie, the women wear large copper rings on their legs called mancellas, though on any excoriation of the skin they produce canker. These rings are everyday burnished and a truly a massive sort of jewellery. Um, okay, I'm going to skip past that. Uh, uh, there's so much to say here, sorry. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to fit it all in. Um, upon outing from seclusion, uh, I'm actually dressed as an Nkugo initiate, even though my things are slipping. Uh, the initiate would dawn has, uh, herself in an elaborate hairstyle. Uh, the central portion, which I have here, um, this central portion here uh, would, is referred to as a thinga. Um, so when Captain Hugh Crow uh, was in the bight uh, in the late 18th century, um, he, he uh, recorded either a thing or some kind of antecedent of that uh, when he wrote the women of Old Calabar are, however, grand in their own way on holidays when they wear dresses of variegated colours, have their hair tightly made up in the foot of a cone, a foot or two, or in the form of a cone, a foot or two above their crowns, a fashion which gives them a remarkable and somewhat dignified appearance. Um, so I was going to go all out today, but I just thought this in itself is extra. <laughs> um, yeah, so this styling would have been accompanied by painting of the face in Ndom, white chalk. Uh, there are pictures of me in Ndom floating about um, and I just I just thought today is too much <laughs> this is an academic conference after all um, so these these were the ways in which they decorated their faces uh, were really symbolic um, and then the initiate would wear a loincloth tied in a bustle about the hip um, yeah I'm not pulling the camera down <sighs> And then they would wear, I don't know if you can hear my bells jingling. I have, uh, you know, I have my calf bands on as well. Um, 
they would wear either waist beads or small bells uh, and anan or bok. So these beads attached by raffia are now wool at the center. Um, and so in the 18th century, they weren't wearing sort of all the stuff I've got on my arms. They were wearing manilas. So either shaped into horseshoe form or coiled around the calf. Um, these women suffered for their fashion, for their beauty. Um, they would wear they would different things that I've not put on because it's, it's really extra. Um, so they would have a beaded shoulder cape um, and of course, this dress would have been subject to geographical and temporal specificities. Um, moreover, from descriptions afforded us by 18th and 19th century commentators, we can deduce that Biafran Atlantic taste was, it, it went beyond being just an imposition of European fashions. Uh, however, it's heavily influenced by fashions popularized in Europe throughout the Georgian Regency and Victorian eras. Um, so this is probably a bit more closer to what I'm wearing. Uh, the woman on the left, um, I believe this was taken at the turn of the 20th century. So she's from Old Calabar. Um, she's wearing, she doesn't have everything I have on. <laughs> um, this is the woman on the right. I'm not sure. I have the date of this photograph somewhere, but I, yeah, I'm not sure what's going on with my uh, MacBook at the moment. Um, okay, so wealth accumulation uh, in the Biafran Atlantic was it was gendered for African men. Um, their taste became ever more ostentatious. Um, so this resulted in the transformation of the built environment. Um, for example, with the construction of multi-storied wooden houses in which they would, these, these houses weren't used for quotidian living, living, they were used to entertain their European counterparts uh, when they were brokering trade deals. Um, and so these houses would be thrown up by carpenters and joiners um, belonging to English slave ships. Um, they would be prefabricated in places like Liverpool and then thrown up um, in Old Calabar and the surrounding region. Um, and these, yeah, these men I was going to include some of their shopping lists, um, which have got just got requests for all sorts. Um, so furniture, uh, tableware, brass pans, um, chamber pots, or yeah, all sorts of things. Large mirrors, uh, clothing, hats, uh, lace trimmed coats lace trimmed for large men, um, gold topped canes. Uh, it's, it's actually really fascinating. Um, tracing how this evolves um, through time is fascinating as well, but I don't have time to go into all of that. Um, and so women didn't really participate in that. The women, on the other hand, they wore their wealth in the form of these manilas. Um, and they oversaw large populations of domestic slaves as well. Um, Mary, yeah. Mary, Sorry. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, um, stop you, me. Just, no, 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 you don't have to stop it. Just if you could wrap it up, thanks. Okay. Um, okay, so for women of the Biafran Atlantic, wealth accumulation had a non savory side. <laughs> Uh, the expansion of Atlantic markets tilted the balance of power firmly towards African men who were known for abusing their power. Um, so Antara Duke reported an incident in which two of uh, Ebo Yong, Off Yong wives fought uh, with the result that one broke out the other's teeth uh, and the men decided the one who broke out the other wife's teeth 
had to have her own teeth broken out. Uh, on another incident, Duke reported hearing the firing of a musket. Uh, when he sent a couple of slaves to find out what had happened, he found out that his brother had shot at one of his wives but had missed. Um, so there's no description of what this wife had done, but the following day she's forced to drink doctor, which is to participate in the Acerabin a serum poison being ordeal. Uh, so it was poison that was ground up. Uh, if you drank it, you were guilty. And you died, you were guilty. So she dies. Uh, there were incidents throughout the diary where wives are made to drink doctor. Um, so the diary is replete with examples of violent force being used to subdue women errant slaves and their neighbors. Uh, any benefits that elite women enjoyed as a result of expanding slave markets was mitigated by the loss of at least a degree of autonomy uh, and exposure to abuses meted out by powerful men. Um, and so what James Holman and his companions stumbled on that January morning in 1828 was the denouement of a beauty ritual which marked the passage from elite girlhood to womanhood. It was also much more these women were in many ways, the breathing embodiment of wealth accumulation and expansion in the Biafran Atlantic. They were themselves forms of currency. They oversaw vast fortunes in the form of land blessed with an overabundance of agricultural produce and ever expanding slave populations. These women wore their newly acquired wealth and wore it well. Furthermore, they ate their wealth, and this eating of wealth had multiple implications. On the one hand, in the absence of financial institutions, they became lenders, brokers, living, breathing exchange mechanisms. These women were walking banks, affluent in their own right, their gas, indicators of capital investment, their fashions, indicative of the extent to which they drove demand in foreign manufactured goods. They exemplify the extent to which expansion of Atlantic slave markets transformed African cultures in the peculiar gendered ways this manifested in this and neighboring locations. Um, Mkugo, however, also had practical considerations for young girls entering seclusion at the onset of puberty. It was tied to their reproductive cap uh, capabilities. The stretching of the body, mind and spirit was supposed to aid the initiate in easier childbirth. For these girls, marriage, the production of issue, management of enslaved labor, of agricultural crops, crops of their burgeoning wealth was the ultimate goal. Um, they lived in an age characterized by an illicit trade and all its accompanying precarity, even on the occasion of marrying well. The fates of these women were subject to rapid and often unforeseen changes. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Um, so, Katie, if um, you want to also um, put your video on, we can um, start as we have done. If you guys have any questions for each other, <laughs> um, um, I, I do have some questions as well, and we already have some building up in the in the um, uh, in the queue. So, um, yeah. Um, I do have a question. I want to say, firstly, thank you, Mary. That was so fascinating. Um, and I do see a lot of, and also that you dressed for the occasion. Um, <laughs> you look fantastic. I was curious um, if you could say a little bit more about hair um, and gender and a little bit more on the crown that you were discussing as well. Okay, so Etenge uh, is the central portion. All these portions that I've got, um, I've plaited the back of my hair, uh, which, you wouldn't ordinarily do. I need someone to help me basically to yeah, fix this properly. Um, so these segments, they all have different names, which I can't remember off head. And even if I could remember them, I'd probably massacre them. I do apologize for my pronunciation. Um, yeah, hair transforms actually. I've, I've come across quite a, a lot of stuff about transforming hairstyles. Uh, throughout the 18th century specifically, um, and also the 19th century. Um, it's also, it has ritual meanings as well. So there are certain hairstyles. There's one uh, a, a little bit similar to how my hair is at the front and the sides. Um, and it's supposed to represent 
the breasts and the nipples of like a young girl um and I I never knew that until very recently and I just thought that was fascinating sorry I'm taking all of this off because it's a bit much um yeah so it has it has ritual uses uh when girls went into seclusion uh it's mkugo uh in ethic it's ekuk mbobo or Mbobo uh, in Ibibio, it's Monin Kim in Ejagam. Um, yeah, they would learn all about all of these different styles, uh, the meanings, the uses, um, even the Ndom that was painted on the face, it had ritual meanings, uh, different meanings. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what much to say about that. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. Thank you. You're welcome. Um. I just I think it's really interesting that both that in both of yours the sort of relationship between um, questions of gender and questions of dependency, right? And like the idea of um, of dependency and status um, as being as being sort of tied up with things that um, uh, that are gendered and I was just wondering if you if you guys wanted to talk any more about um about the idea of status and gender and also it's a shame that um Philip Emmanuel isn't here anymore because I feel like he would also have something to say about status and gender um I don't know Katie do you want to go yeah I'm trying to think of where to um home in on this really great question. I mean, I think that what I am finding in palace chronicles that are accessible to me right now between the 18th and 19th century is that um, gender and status are quite fluid and that this case of um, perhaps considering age and gender mm -hmm. um, rather than sex and gender is really important in the 18th century and kind of disappears in 19th century palace chronicles. Um, to my knowledge so far that I've been reading, particularly um, Ibn Abi Adiyaf, which is a common palace chronicle a lot of uh, Tunisian scholars look at or Tunisian historians look at. Um, and I see that much more at play in the 18th century. So that's why I'm really grateful for this conference's periodization focus. It's so important because it kind of, it helps to shift um, the givenness of certain categories. And I think particularly the gender and status are really productive questions to look at in the 18th century. Um, okay, gender and, and status. Um, uh, yeah, I think age and gender is really important actually. Uh, so senior women have a higher ranking status uh, in the Cross River Basin. Uh, not just in the 18th century, but also uh, right into the 20th century. Um, and so you see, um, so when ships would land and they were about to broker a trade deal, uh, some of the chief recipients of komi or like sort of a docking tax would be senior wives uh, of prominent uh, ethic slave traders. Um, and they would receive, I don't know, gunpowder, which is a bit random. So perhaps that implies that they had guns. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I've not seen, I've not seen any direct references to women owning firearms, uh, but I've seen them receiving powder uh, and saving their men from being blown up by powder as well. Uh, yeah, which is quite fascinating. Um, they they receive like particularly in the 18th century, the mid to late 18th century, they're receiving extortionate, um, just crazy quantities of voyage iron of Manilas. Um, and they're also driving demand in certain uh, goods. So like, I don't know, basins, things like that. Um, they've got ritual uses, uh, but they're also used in food prep um, and in bathing their husbands and children, and those sorts of things. Um, 
yeah. Great. Um, so with our final half hour, um, I would just like to ask everybody who has been a presenter, who'd be willing to turn their cameras on <laughs> um, uh, from the last, you know, whatever, four exciting days. Um, uh, because um, I was hoping that we could have a sort of more general discussion. Um, I don't know how this is going to work on Zoom, but have a more general discussion of um, of the question of the 18th century um, and whether whether we think that there's anything productive <laughs> about just focusing on the 18th century. Um, and like, you know, obviously you've all um, invested time. So it's like sunk cost fallacy. Of course, we think that the 18th century is a good idea, but uh, but maybe we don't. Maybe we think actually you just can't do the 18th century. You have to do, you know, all of pre-colonial um, together, or maybe you have to do, you know, I don't know, different things for different places or whatever. Um, so yeah, the main question I have is, do we think the 18th century is a useful sort of way of thinking about um, time? Um, in Africa, and um, and does that have sort of different meanings for the different regions that we've been looking at? Um, throughout, I've had this feeling like like of being an alien and coming down and like and and what we're reading is like these like bizarre encounters where like we're trying to extrapolate so much from like <laughs> from these people who didn't really care to give us the information that we that we really needed. Um, and I feel like actually today um, with like looking at the sort of uh, questions of urban morphology and stuff, I feel like actually, you know, there is there is lots to say that isn't based on what slave traders have to tell us. Um, and so I, I'm, I personally feel like we got a lot of, out of the 18th century, but I want to hear what you guys think. Um, I don't know how to do this in a way where, but just like, I think basically just un unmute yourself and start talking and, and, you know, we'll see how it goes. Uh, hello, uh, let me start. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I think on my side, I, I find it is actually really uh, very interesting uh, in the sense that I, because of studying on Okavango Delta, uh, I was really fascinated in the sense of uh, the ori origin of the language as well, of what is called Setawana. So on how it really came together. So it came together in the in the 18th century when the, the, uh, the different tribes were coming together and they tried to communicate and they formulate this kind of a, of a language. Yeah, from, the, from that point of view, I find it really so, so interesting. And I do have a really keen, I had a really keen on, uh, on studying the development of what is called uh, Setawan or Maulingo as it really developed you know, up to up to up to the, up to up to this moment, so it's a it's a language that has been disdained and put aside, but it's finds its root in the in the second in the in the 18th century. So to me, that becomes very very profound uh, for my study. Yeah. Come on, guys, just jump in. <laughs> All right, I'll jump in. <laughs> um, I like to say- I can't talk our... a lot because my baby is screaming in the background, so. I'll talk real fast. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, I, I, I sort of like to, unintentionally, I think, in having a dialogue with our 19th century colleagues uh, on Africa, I always, bring up the point of, you know, they, they lay out the 19th century very well in, in their, in any of their research. And I always say, but where did it all begin? And I think that's, I think that's what's fascinating about this, about the conference that we've had, is that there's many ways to approach it uh, in, in our work, uh, but there's always, you, you, there's the beginning. And this is the beginning of what the explosion occurs in, uh, 19th century uh, urbanization, as we as we heard today, uh, uh, gender, uh, and all the topics that we've uh, brought about. There, there has to be a beginning to that 19th century, and that's where I think our work as 18th century 
exists uh, in Africa. I think that's where it comes uh, really uh, uh, crucial uh, that we do, there has to be a beginning somewhere and we're it. And, uh, and just uh, that point I'd just like to quickly make and then uh, the whole interdisciplinary approach uh, that you know, I try to bring to my work and which was just uh, fascinating listening to everybody else's uh, viewpoints on how the 18th century Africa work just, uh, just reinforces all that, that we have to look at the many different approaches to the available archives and uh, uh, cultural materials, uh, visual cultures, the whole bit, and how we all have to uh, in integrate that as well. And just not necessarily related to our 19th century colleagues, but uh, we, we can certainly uh, do that as well. Maybe I could just make a comment for uh, West Central Africa, which is not terribly well represented here, but somewhat. Um, the 18th century is a wasteland compared to the 17th century, just in terms of the nature and quality of documentation we have. Um, and I mean, I, where I work, um, the first half of the 16th century is actually documented entirely by African authored documentation, or almost entirely. Um, and that never quite ceases to exist, but it becomes very, very limited in the 18th century. Uh, and it's, I mean, I just, you know, I just finished publishing a book on West Central Africa and a good half of the book is for the 17th century. And that's not, you know, that's because the documentation runs out um, and it doesn't really resume until the, the 19th century. Uh, and I, I've worked in other areas in the Gold Coast, the 18th century is a golden age for documentation. You know, all that stuff, you just have to learn a lot of languages, but other than that, you know, it's, uh, it's all, a lot of stuff is there. You can really work with a lot of material. So it's just, I think a lot of what we know and do has to do with, you know, whether we like it or not, the type of source material we have access to um, and who was there and what were they doing. Um, and, and sometimes that's just slave traders. Sometimes it's missionaries, which is in my case, more than slave traders. Um, and then they have their own interests and in all the other stuff that goes into the critical study of the documentation we use. Can I come back as an archaeologist <laughs> and say the 18th century is when it all ends, really? Um, and in fact, we've seen a lot of papers today with the sort of lingerie going back into the 15th century or even earlier. Um, and there's actually the 18th century really is a wasteland because we spend all our time looking at the earlier, earlier period. And that's kind of what drew me to this conference because it's missed out, but it's missed out because it's the end, not the beginning. Um, mm. I'm sure the other archaeologists, any left here on the conference, would agree with me. That was definitely the sense that I was getting today as well. And I mean, you know, it makes some sense if you're looking, especially, I guess, if you're looking at, you know, the Fulani Jihads as sort of starting a new era um, at the beginning of the 19th century. Well, the, to come in as the other archaeologist, the problem we have, which uh, we raised in the discussion group on Saturday, is that archaeologically, we, we cannot make any sense of data using uh, radiocarbon or other methods between the 17th and the 21st centuries. So we are reliant on oral history or on historical records. And, and that is where we are in terms of archaeological approaches to the African past or indeed the past of any other part of the world, basically. So um, we are indeed, as Mark says, you know, the 18th century is kind of the end of, of what we can do using the techniques that we know, unless we deploy a whole range of other sources as, as Mark has done in Zanzibar, as we did in Benin, where you, you talk to oral historians and look at historical evidence. Yes, I just say this, 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 this sort of lacuna of decent chronology, I wouldn't be quite as pessimistic as that. Um, I mean, you know, basically after really 1700, radiocarbon dates don't work until starts, people start blowing up atom bombs in the atmosphere, um, <laughs> where we can see a spike. Um, you know, we do have a few coins, you know, we do have European contact, so that's is bringing in some chronological control for us. But by and large, there is virtually no way in which we can tell between the early or the late 18th century and for 
basically from our archaeological material culture. Okay. Sorry, can I just say something? Um, yeah, this is going, I don't know, sort of completely away from archaeology. Um, uh, so the region that I'm looking at, uh, the slave trade really picks up uh, late 17th and throughout the 18th century. So it's kind of the beginning for me. Uh, yeah, I know it's kind of the end for <laughs> archaeologists. Um, but for me, this is kind of, um, yeah, there's, I don't know, uh, rich sort of textual sources. Um, I would actually like to go, I wasn't interested in the 18th century to begin with. I wanted to look at the 17th century. Um, but because I have uh, this language defici deficiency um, in continental European languages, um, yeah, it's, it's I, I don't know what was happening in that region sort of before then. I started in the 18th century because uh, those were the English sources. This sounds so lazy now. <laughs> I'm speaking to all these brilliant academics. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's what was available, if that makes sense. Um, but I think this is, this is something that came up you know, a few times um, throughout, which is that because the 18th century is not the colonial period, um, yeah. the sort of the, and I mean, I think this sort of aligns as well with with the archeological stuff, it, the sort of plurality of languages that like, you know, it's just, um, I think Allegro was talking about like, you have to follow, you know, who was there, not necessarily, <laughs> Um, expecting to find the the detail in the particular colonial archive of the place that becomes the colon colonial um, government of the of, of, of um, the region, um, but it but I guess it goes along with the sort of multiplicity of methods as well. I mean, so not just um, needing to read things in a variety of random languages as you get, you know, Swedish travelers or, you know, Italian maps or whatever um, in, in various um, random archives, but also needing to um, be creative about looking at different kinds of sources, um, you know, sideways or whatever, um, whether that's, yeah, I mean, you know, you guys have represented a really great amount of <laughs> different kinds of approaches to these questions. I would just like to add too that this conference is such a testament um, to the possibility of 18th century African history. I think not to throw like other 18th century history workshops under the bus, but they tend to not focus on the African continent at all. It's Europe and um, America's focused and only in the past year with greater racial reckonings, have there, has there been attention by other workshops towards um, narrating 18th century African experiences. So just at the point that this is fully possible, it required kind of this historical zeitgeist that we're in right now to, to make this happen more frequently among historians and other, um, and other academics. I think, yeah, I'm just looking forward to the future of scholarship. Controversial question, but do you think it's useful to think of the continent as a continent in this period? Or, I mean, is, I mean, like, I, I really enjoyed doing that with all of you from all of your different regions, but, um, but would it have been a more fun or productive conference for you if it had been, you know, um, focused on the sort of trading zones or intellectual, um, areas of circulation or, you know, in you know, areas of political control that would have been relevant to different regions rather than thinking about it as a continent. There aren't very many of us in, in this field. Um, and the more we can have broad conferences and broad questions, the more likely we are to have a lively discussion um, just because 
so many, so there's so few of us that are doing this. Um, it's just great to get together with people here and, and see new people doing new work. That's very exciting to me. Um, and so I, you know, I'm really happy to see everybody here and I'm glad to see so many graduate students working on these topics now. Bronwyn, I will say it's a really interesting kind of historiographical question though, right? Because, you know, there is all these, all these pushes to do Atlantic history or, you know, the history of kind of the Indian Ocean world and these kind of kind of trading groups, you know, but there's also this push to do continental history, like the Americanists are all into, you know, continental history of, you know, um, of the Americas. Um, so, you know, what's lost and gained in that is really interesting. And it, it's interesting for me as an interloper to kind of come into this question, because I've found myself listening to everybody and being like, okay, I have, you know, people start talking about the, the West Coast and I'm like, whoa, these are some specifics that I have no idea what's going on. And I was like, that's because if we were in Europe, I'd be like, you know, we're talking about Italy and now we're in France, you know? And so, you know, what's, what do you, you know, what's lost or gained in, in that is a, is a very interesting question. So I don't have any great insights into that, but it's a really, I think, interesting way to kind of approach this. I think it's also important to look at Africa in the 18th century, looking from my perspective, some of the work I did on in coastal West Africa, the material culture of that area is actually better known through studies in the Americas of displaced people as it is uh, through studies actually on the original sites in, in West Africa. So it there's that kind of imbalance where diasporic scholars have, have highlighted the, the danger that is inherent in treating African ceramics in this case in the North or Caribbean America as representative of diverse communities in West Africa. And the work hasn't been done in West Africa, partly because people, um, well, it just there's a lot of stuff that needs to happen in West African archaeology. And one of the things is the 18th century archaeology. So there is that imbalance where Americanist scholars may know a lot more about the West African material culture in North America than was actually used in West Africa at that time. So it's a long winded answer to your question, which is, yes, I think the 18th century does have a validity um, and an existence in a, in a wider regional area in Africa. And I'll just, I'm just going to keep going here, but I mean, I think the linking, you know, like there's, a, we've had a lot on the kind of West African coast and the Eastern coast. And I think papers like a Torah year paper really shows us this kind of almost the importance of like the interior and the continent, right? And those kind of trading links between. But I think, you know, we go back to sources and I think, you know, one of the, the struggles there is, you know, where, you know, a lot of us have dependent on these European sources that are on the coasts, right? And getting to that interior, which could probably tell us this fascinating story is, is more difficult. And, you know, maybe that's the, the glorious thing about the 18th century, but also the kind of hardship is, is just, you know, it's gonna take a lot of imagination, a lot of work. Um, we, we need a lot more, you know, archeologists out there to help us out, you know, um, creativity with oral sources, but, um, yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why it's that's an an interesting kind of question to play with. Well, if I may come in as you know, somebody who's trying to uh, to work on Southern Africa has been trying to do so for a few years. Uh, well, first of all, Brian, to answer to your you know provocation, uh, yeah, I do think that working on a continental basis it, it's it's uh, really an important you know an, an important feature um, because. You know, South Africa, Southern Africa, is, it tends to be seen as something else somehow. Uh, first of all, I mean, I have the feeling that a lot of the scholarship really starts with, the, you know, the, you know, the Dutch and the British periods are very strongly separated. And when you do African history, so to say, you tend to consider only, you know, the British Empire as the, you know, the, the backdrop of that history. 19th century British Empire and that kind of stuff, um, and, and the Dutch period, as we have seen in you know in the first day, speaking about the Cape Colony is considered as radically different. Um, and then you know, the point is a lot of the papers really spoke, really rang a lot of bells. Uh, I, I heard you know similar stories, similar approaches. 
uh, and challenges and, and when it comes to archaeology and oral sources most definitely um the fact that you know archaeologists really struggle now with uh, carbon dating is of course a pity but i must say at least archaeologists in south africa have have worked a lot more than historians on the 18th century even you know to the point of realizing that some of their assumptions about sequences and datings uh, might be uh, wrong and to need to be rewritten but at least they have worked on that well from the part of historians um you, you do i mean you know the tendency has been to you know to start really from the early 19th century for a long time we believe that nothing was going on in african societies before that time and um and it's just very recent that people are starting to pick up the fight and actually address oral sources seriously so it's really refreshing for me to you know to communicate with all of you about uh, similar i mean similar topics and similar challenges um and why not maybe even think that you know communication was was there and people knew about you know zimbabwe and angola maybe even if they were <laughs> born and bred in southern interior southern africa um but the struggle with the sources is real <laughs> definitely <laughs> I just had um, this last semester, I, uh, I don't know if I the right word is taught, but I, I um, managed uh, some very uh, uh, energetic uh, undergrads in this sort of this undergrad research thing. It was a, um, not the most um, uh, stellar moment in, uh, in the history of undergrad research, but um, uh, they, there was one of the uh, on, uh, continuing themes on sort of in, in sort of 17th and earlier century African history or was, was there's was, there's was a desire by these participants to um, uncover in their in their words the the the, the 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 time back when we were kings and queens right you, you'll hear variations of that same that, that same thing over and over again and one of the things that kept coming up was a um that so much time has gone by uh or during the very period that they, I mean, they, they wanted everything prior to, 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 to 1700, which is of course, thousands of years. And what they were not finding was like a sort of any kind of an ethnic purity. There's, there's just so much, I mean, so much history has gone by over these, these many centuries that you have so many people meeting one another, encountering one another, being changed by one another as they listen to one another and as they become new people. And so um, one of the things that these, uh, one of the students in this, this, uh, this seminar was, was coming away with was this, she, uh, at first it was, she said, at first I was frustrated and, uh, that I wasn't finding sort of the pure uh, untainted roots, but now I'm starting to find that maybe that I, that was the wrong question. So maybe what I need to look at is instead of, of purity, what I need to look at is the possibilities, uh, the, the diverse uh, possibilities there are or were for being human in pre uh, 17th century or 1700s Africa. And this was kind of this, this really weird. And of course the entire seminar was being held by zoom anyway. So it was, it was, um, um, but I, I, I feel like this workshop here also with these, um, 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 uh, interdisciplinary approaches as well. I mean, we've got just, I, 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 um, I, it's been really refreshing to hear on that one, but I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm, I don't, know if I have a really question here. There was more of a response to some of the things here that we're not going to find that that sort of purity. Um, but maybe that's the wrong question. Yeah, I mean, to me, the 18th century, I, I yeah, I mean, I don't, I think of it as, um, I guess, being, um, being the sort of transition period from the medieval Africa stuff that you know we teach and then to the um colonial period africa stuff um and that there is this you know the rise of the slave trade and the collapse of the old order kind of kind of story and so i think 
for me positioning like just looking at and, and i think i said this in the call for papers like what i was interested in was was sort of not foreshadowing but that was as not foreshadowing <laughs> like can we think of the 18th century and i guess I, the, from the archaeological perspective you know can we not think of it as the end can we not think of it as the beginning can we think of it in in its own right as being something and i i said this to the fashion group on saturday like can it can we think of it as being something with change within its own self you know with um where we can track change over time in the in these various places political change cultural change fashion change um social changes and economic changes that are that are happening i guess without think yeah without thinking about it as being an ending or a beginning of something else but just as as its own century right like so we're like oh we're not in the 20th century anymore although like i fully fall into all of those twitter memes that are like when i think it's 30 years ago i think it's 1970 um but you know so we're we're not in the 20th century anymore we're now in the 21st century but um we don't know where it's going right so we're experiencing it now we don't know where it's going and we're probably also not thinking it's the end of whatever we've just done i mean there are probably people out there who are predicting it's the end of whatever we've done and so i, I guess what i'm trying to recapture is the feeling of presentism in the 18th century um and, and i was just yeah you know methodologically how how do we even do that when the sources are so sparse the sources are in a huge variety of languages the sources are told by outsiders who have no idea what's going on and who tell everything as though it's always been this way and it will always forever be this way um so yeah i i really like what you're what you're asking there brana and, and i guess i guess my hesitancy about thinking about the 18th century as a as a framework is actually what you were sort of indicating where if we don't position the 18th century as the beginning to something or as the end to something, um, I mean, I think it is eclipsed into other centuries. Like if I think about, say, like relations between land and power in the Gold Coast, what I presented on, um, I, I, I don't, it would be hard from the sources to be able to say this was a definitive turning point or transformative period because we just don't know that much about what came earlier. But we do know that these kind of same practices continue later. And so I think it's just sort of interesting where I do think that when people focus on the 19th century, like I do, people tend to, you know, have that one chapter that's like, this was what things were like before colonialism and, and time is sort of packaged in on itself, or it's just an episode very shortly before maybe the early 19th century where things are sort of frozen in a non-dynamic way just to create the setting or to set the stage. Um, and I think the interesting thing about the 18th century is, well, if we look at this then as a period that was like very dynamic, um, that isn't just a snapshot before things radically change, you are able to see a lot of continuity, just, just a tremendous amount of continuity into the 19th century, into the 20th century. But if we are looking at that continuity, I don't know that the 18th century makes sense as a framework because there will be continuity with the 17th and with the 16th and we don't really know what was going on before the 15th um and so so i think that i think it was an interesting challenge for me um and i think a lot of people like ended up presenting papers that had the 18th century a little bit but also had the 17th and also had the 16th for that for that exact same reason that they're that unless you're focusing on some sort of key event or moment that is really fixed in the 18th century your story is naturally going to spread in both directions I think um, periodization is a is a, an obsession of historians and archaeologists, and one has to be honest about it that the 18th century is just a convenient frame, which probably means very different things in very different areas. And and I would I would actually move away from the slave trade, which, as we all know, there were different manifestations over a millennium or more with different directions, and I wouldn't see it necessarily as the you know the defining um feature i would just be un unapologetic and say yes this is just a period of 100 years you can make it the long 18th century if you want to which a lot of medievalist colleagues do uh consider it to span 150 years if you want and just make it a very artificial construct you're saying certainly this is how we thought of our papers is 
actually, let's look at our evidence and see what it is we can say about that century and a half. It probably meant nothing to people on the ground, let's be fair. But it's interesting. It makes us think about things in a different way. And in, and in that sense, I think you can look at the African continent or, or the world, if you want to, through that framework. But you just say this is an artificial construct. It's just so unfair because the Americanists get to be like, 1776, we're going to write a whole book about 1776. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> I might just say that if we move ourselves away from a, a European perspective on Africa, the slave trade and that kind of thing, the, the continent breaks into multiple historiographies that are you know, ultimately really quite unrelated to each other. And so unfortunately that makes then the Atlantic contact um, the story that brings everybody together. And and it also artificially prevents us from looking at what's going on internally in African societies. It's a harder task to do. Um, the documentation is less explicit. It's more problematic. But at the same time, it's clear that we're not talking about the same thing all over the place. Um, and that doesn't really happen until much later, I think, um, maybe even in the colonial period. Thank you all so much for indulging me in my desire to know more about 18th century Africa. Um, I have had a really great time. <laughs> I hope you've all enjoyed it too. Um, and uh, I think there has been some general interest in um, some kind of something edited or whatever. Um, so I will email around and see if people are interested in, in that those kinds of things. Um, I don't know. I can't promise you that I'll do anything very soon, but I will try. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you have any particular ideas about anything, um, creative formats or um, you know anything at all, just uh, feel free to email me with your your own ideas about this. This does not have to be my my baby. Um, I have three of those. I don't need another. <laughs> um, so uh, I think that's everything. Um, thank you all again so, so much. Um, there are lots of things in the chat, people saying thank you to you all for your excellent, excellent work. Um, I'm really excited to see all of this in some stage or another uh, in other places. Um, and uh, hopefully we get to meet again in person um you know sometime but i actually do have to say that i do think like despite everything i think that um zoom has been amazing for allowing all of us to come together i was like counting the countries that we were coming from and like and it's just fascinating and fantastic and i don't think we would have been able to do something like this if it hadn't been for zoom so thank you to zoom <laughs> um and thanks again to judith for allowing us to use zoom and for um facilitating all of this um, and I will hopefully see you all in person at some point. Thank you so Bye, much. Bye, Bronwyn. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judith. Bye. Thank you.